Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Well, we need no introduction to the speaker, so I can sit down. But uh, seriously, this is Dr. Mark Brown. He's sitting right over here in front. Um, Dr. Mark Brown is a University of Natal honorary researcher. It's my university as well. Um, called, now called University KwaZulu Natal, but I'm still writing my cards, University of Natal. Um, Doctorate of Wildlife, Zoology. And um, there's also a penguin release on Saturday if you come on time. So, um, Dr. Mark Brown has been here for a number of years. He's also a pastor at a community church. Um, he's well known in Plettenberg Bay, and he's going to talk about the 20 years of Nature's Valley. And right up to today, you can see all how the progression has. Dr. Mark Brown is right in the very front. Dr. Mark Brown. No, I've got this one. Thank you very much, Len, and it's lovely to be here this evening. Thank you for the invitation. I feel quite honoured to talk at your AGM. Uh, I follow the society uh, a little bit as a voyeur on the side, reading in the papers and checking out the website every now and again, um, and always interested in the projects that you guys are running. Um, and while you actually don't need me to talk, let's get William back up here, because that map is just amazing. Well done, guys. So, very cool. Okay, so I'm cheating a little bit with my title tonight, because actually we only turn 20 as an NGO next December. So, but uh, it just sounds better to say 20 years of uh, sort of conservation success in, in the pet region. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, it's the first time I'm giving this talk. I'm hoping to develop it a little bit further and give it a, a few times next year in the, in the lead up to our big 20 year celebration. Um, but we'll start with it off uh, this evening. And I wanted to start with a quote from one of our founding members, Jeff McKilleran, who's a, a resident in Nature's Valley, and many of you all know Jeff. He's a world-renowned photographer and author, um, and was one of the first trustees of the Nature's Valley Trust. And Jeff wrote this in 2001. He said, When our ancestors shared planet Earth with other animals, living with them as equals, we respected and understood them. Indeed, our very survival depended on it. Although blunted and bruised by man's total domination of planet Earth, these links lie deep, hidden within us, but we need them today. Why otherwise the desire to escape the pressures of concrete jungles and seek the solace of our natural world? And uh, I'd actually like to read that out in a David Attenborough sort of accent at some stage. <laughs> Because I think Jeff is just, uh, it's a goosebump quote. I, I really, it hits me when I read that. Um, and this was in the founding document that uh, came out when Nature's Valley Trust was launched. Um, and I think it really rings true for many of us. The reason why we find ourselves living in a place like this is because of the natural affinity we have for the natural world. And so Nature's Valley Trust as a conservation organization started in December 2000. And there were 10 families, homeowners in Nature's Valley, that provided the original funding. Um, they started off with a fundraising evening with David Rattray, giving one of his world-renowned uh, lectures on uh, the Zulu battlefields and that. Um, and initial trustees were Professor Sue Milton, who lives in Prince Albert, uh, Lindy Rodwell, who's still one of our uh, current uh, trustees at the moment, and Jeff McLaren himself. And the initial mission statement that was kind of put out was this, to maintain the long-term environmental integrity of nature's valley and surrounds by becoming proactively involved in issues that impact on the future of the area. And that was the context in which uh, our organization was founded. And it really came on a rich heritage of uh, a community in nature's valley being proactively involved in maintaining the environment of nature's valley. And the next slide is going to maybe be of interest to some of you guys. So that's an aerial view of Nature's Valley, but on this map is a series of developments that the community managed to stop over the years. And so most of you might not even know this, but let me show you some of them. So that there was going to be a petrol station in Nature's Valley. That was stopped by activists within the community. This was a power line that was going to come along down the road um, across the estuary and carry on there. That was rerouted by um, residents and homeowners in Nature's Valley because it would have been a real eyesore and a real footprint 
in this beautiful pristine area. Uh, this was the railway line that was going to run along the front of the dune through Nature's Valley. It was proposed and it was about to go ahead when it was stopped. I can't remember the years that these things happened. But if you go down to the south coast of KwaZulu Natal, which where my wonderful wife Kelly grew up, where does the railway line run? Right along the front dunes. And that would have happened here as well. But for citizens who were interested and passionate about the natural environment. Uh, I mean, I shouldn't actually be giving this historical talk. Marina should be giving this section of the talk. Um, this here was a, a, a holiday resort that was going to be built up on the cliffs um, near the Covey community, where Pig's Head and that is, and the end of the Otter Trail. Uh, and I can't remember one, uh, and this was one that was also going to be built on the Salt River side, one of which was the old uh, South African telecommunications and postal services, and the other one I think was a South African police service sort of holidays resort for for um, staff members and that, employees. But those were stopped, and obviously then at a later stage, that those areas were incorporated into what is now the Tsitsikama section of the Garden Route National Park. So we had this unique little municipal suburb. There are 400 earths, um, 380 developed houses, surrounded by National Park. There was another development, this one here. This was also originally part of the municipal suburb, mapped out for development with Plots allocated and everything, but it's right in the floodplain. You cannot build there at all, and it's a good thing they didn't do it, but the community stopped that. So we've got this incredible um, place that looks like it's an extension of the forest. That's all artificial. It was ploughed farmland in the 1960s. There was not a tree there, and there was one little farmhouse and one little dam. And then it was sold off by a farmer who was one of the original Bonardo family members and uh, developed by the Nature's Valley Property Development Corporation into a municipal township. And uh, the houses themselves had very strict title restrictions, title deed restrictions. There's limits as to how big on the plot you can build, how high you can go. Um, gaps between different uh, properties have to be of a certain size and that allows um, the wildlife to just naturally walk through and move through those properties and it's allowed the forest to extend down into the municipal suburb. And so we now sit with a very unique situation, a relatively pristine municipal suburb untainted by bizarre developments that have occurred everywhere else along the coast in an area that's now surrounded completely by a national park. It's an absolutely phenomenal little piece of paradise. Now, I've got a photograph of myself on the beach by the lagoon in October 1975. So this is part of the historical aspect of the talk. I was born in July 1975. And um, so as a baby, I was on that beach. And a few years ago, I actually took a photo to try and match up to the photo that my mum gave me. Um, and it's amazing to think that families and, and people and visitors and homeowners have been enjoying this pristine beauty because it looks very similar still for decades upon decades upon decades. It was about 1965, if I recall exactly the year that the municipal um, sort of suburb was formed. Okay. So let's look at Nature's Valley Trust, so a brief history. Formed in December 2000, uh, there was a, a master's student who was hired um, from January to March in 2001, followed by another um, sort of intern, uh, John Fuert, was in May 2001 to put together what was called a, a sort of strategic document of what should Nature's Valley Trust be involved with, what, why was there a need for an environmental organisation, um, and really came up with a beautiful um, document that unpacked the, in, the issues that affect the environment in Nature's Valley and its surrounding areas. And the immediate surrounding areas of interest at that particular time were, in particular, Covey, the community up at the top there, and then the Curland community and the Crags community as well. So the catchment areas feeding down into Nature's Valley, the users, the other residents that come down and use the beach, and that sort of thing. And it was a wonderful document, and I still refer back to it every now and again. 
In 2002, Julie Carlisle was appointed as the first program director, and Julie's still a very active conservationist in the pet region, uh, and she's one of our board of trustees members as well at the moment. We now have to, we've got seven trustees. Julie is the only trustee that's a resident in Bitter. Um, all the other trustees are either Joburg-based or Cape Town-based, but they all have homes in Nature's Valley. And then uh, Julie moved on further in her career uh, in 2008, and Daniel Pluto was appointed um, as the new program director, and Daniel spent uh, a good stint of uh, four or five years uh, heading up Nature's Valley Trust. Um, in these early days, the focus was really, and I'll show you just now, the focus was really um, a little bit of environmental activism, just a watchdog of making sure that developments that were proposed were legal, were ethical and responsible, and that homeowners were educated about the environmental needs of a place like Nature's Valley. Julie came in and really started uh, developing community-based projects and environmental education initiatives, and that was quite key to the sort of evolution of uh, us as an organization. Um, and then quite importantly, at that stage, up until then, there's always just one person in the office. Our office is a double garage down in Nature's Valley that we rent, which now houses up to um, 12 people sometimes. Um, but in October 2009, uh, the organization took on their first uh, conservation intern. It was a young lass, Cindy Lee Clutter, who was uh, um, from Springbok, and uh, a young development student who was taken on into a position funded by uh, WWF South Africa uh, as a conservation intern to run environmental education programs based in Nature's Valley. And Cindy um, only left us two or three years ago. She sort of moved from an 18-month internship position into a permanent staff position with Nature's Valley Trust, developed our community programs up to the level where we are now, where we put up to 5,000 community members through education and awareness programs um, every single year. Work with most of the local schools, and I'll show you some examples of those programs just now. Cindy now is one of the upper managers in Wesser. Based in Johannesburg, she oversees the Eco Schools program for the whole country, uh, whereas down here she was running Eco Schools in a couple of schools. Uh, she also oversees a, a new exciting program WESA developed two years ago, which is called the Young African Reporters uh, Program. So uh, it's, it's school children who are environmental reporters or journalists, and they go out and they do filming and they put the story about our environmental needs out through digital multimedia and stuff like that. And she's heading up a couple of other projects for WESA, one specifically around forest um, projects in schools and education around forests and that. So she's done really well and flown the flag uh, internationally as well. She was one of President Obama's uh, Young African Leaders uh, programs a few years ago. She went across to the States for an eight-week stint um, on the, the Washington Fellowship. And then in November I was uh, 2012, I was brought in uh, to kind of add a, a different dimension to the organization, and that was to bring in the element of basing our decisions on sound uh, science and on good quality data. See, in the past, it was easy to stop stuff like that based on emotion and shouting loudly. Mm -hmm. It got you somewhere. It doesn't get you very far today, unfortunately. But what there was a recognition as time went on that the, the place was special, but saying it was special wasn't enough. We had to prove that it was special. We had to do long-term ecological studies to understand the animals and the plants and the ecosystems and to justify why further development in a place like this shouldn't occur. And so I was brought on board with a, with a background of working full-time at a university and, and managing postgraduate students and that, and said, uh, go for it, do your thing. And uh, so the 1st of November, a few uh, days ago, was my seventh anniversary of uh, running the organization and living in Plett. And we love it, and we can't be happier than raising our children in this, this beautiful part of the world. So the next timeline, uh, or the, the next sort of slide, is just going to speak about this new era from 2012 to 2019. What have we done? We've gone from two staff to eight staff currently. Last year we had ten staff. Um, but you know, funding is difficult, and sometimes you can't uh, keep all your posts funded all the time. Over that seven-year period, we've also employed um, 14 South African conservation students 
Some of them got a salary, some of them didn't get a salary, but they were students that got resume quality work experience just being based with us as a staff member. We've also hosted 12 postgraduate students at the Masters and PhD level. Uh, I interact with a number of international and national universities and co-supervise students from them. Um, and we have hosted 60 interns from 17 different countries. And those are interns that actually pay us a nominal fee to come and gain valuable conservation work experience by working on our programs. So we treat them like an intern. They typically come for two or three months, sometimes as long as six months. Uh, in one case, for two years, mom and dad paid for a student, a South African student, to get valuable work experience with us. And that student uh, then I raised funds and put her through a master's program. Uh, so she got a master's degree and she's now been on staff with us for two years and she's currently um, working on turtles in the Seychelles for a couple of weeks on one of my other research programs and she's coming back on Sunday. And we've hosted 26 short-term volunteers that come for two or three weeks, pay a bit of money. It's one of the ways we raise some income and they understand and get to experience what conservation work in Africa is all about. What a terrible view I have as one of my office um, sort of spots. <coughs> so the shift really happened like this. We started out as a watchdog organization, making sure that the environment of integrity of nature's value was safeguarded, especially from uh, development. Understanding that, you know, you've got 400 plot owners in nature's valley. At any one time, you've probably only got about 60 or 70 permanent residents. The rest of those homes stand empty during the year. And people were sitting in Johannesburg, not, and then you come in December and suddenly your neighbors built this big thing and it's crossed the title deed restrictions and it's too late then to do anything about it. So there was a need for a bit of a watchdog organization to keep things in check. And it then Julie took the shift and moved um, towards also focusing on education and awareness and surrounding communities who also have an impact on nature's value. And then brought in the research components and what that's enabled us to do is to really look at things from a holistic point of view, people and biodiversity and the coexistence thereof in this integrated conservation program that we run. And so when we started out um, sort of reshaping the way we did things, we kind of had these four pillars that we said we based our research on. We'd always had our foundation on um, the research, the scientific data, that would be used to come up with locally relevant education programs that we'd run in schools and local communities. And then the sort of outcome would be this uh, better conservation for the area. And it was very easy in the early days to label a project that we did as a research project or an education project or a community program or a conservation outcome. It's now damn difficult because they're so integrated and most of our projects have elements of all of these in it. And it's actually exciting because that's where we should be. And it's one of the things that I feel separates us from your average conservation organization. They'll, your average organization focuses on one or two. But to get it in one big picture like this um, across a region like ours is relatively unique around the country. And more and more people are looking at us and interested in how we're doing it and starting to model it elsewhere, which is really cool. So we recently met uh, as a board of trustees and staff, um, our senior staff and our, uh, most of our trustees met and came up with a, a sort of revised uh, plan, strategy plan for 2020 to 2025 um, in terms of our purpose and our mission and our vision and all of that. Um, and this is what we've come out with. This is not in the public realm yet, so you guys are the first to see this. Uh, it will be going out next year in, as part of the lead up to our 20th celebration. But our purpose remains to maintain the environmental integrity of nature's valley and surrounds for future generations. Now the and surrounds part is where I've also come in and expanded it a little bit, little bit because we really focus on the bitter municipal boundaries. So all the way from Harkerville, all the way through to Kobe is where we run programs and we have for a number of years. And especially, you know, when you're talking about marine conservation, you can't talk about nature's valley. You've got to talk about the whole bay because it's the whole bay that's one ecosystem and one sort of uh, system that's impacted by a whole lot of things. And for example, the more we work on birds that breed on our beaches, the more we realize our birds aren't plate beach birds or keelworms birds or nature's valley birds. 
they actually use the whole coastline and they move. And so we've got baby birds that hatched on Nature's Valley that are now breeding on Lookout Beach, and we know that because of the rings we've put on them. And so taking this holistic, integrated approach across the whole region has been quite influential. Our vision is to be a catalytic conservation initiative that is inclusive and effective. So we're very proactive about including people in everything that we do. Our mission is enabling an integrated stakeholder effort that is proactively involved in issues that impact on the environmental resilience of the area. And we do that by getting involved in all the different conservation forums and plans and strategies for the whole Bitter region. And our strategic goal is to be an integrated ecological research and interpretive program that ensures that the region's ecosystems are maintained and enhanced and underpin long-term social well-being. So that's kind of where we're at. And what I'm going to do now is run you through how we do that. So what does it look like in reality? And then show you some examples from the different projects that we run. I hope that's okay and I hope you're all kind of enjoying the, the talk so far. So this is what we do. We'll identify a problem that's relevant to our area and then we'll go through this uh, five-step process. So we'll first do the research. What impacts are people having on a particular thing? So whether it be uh, fish in the ocean, litter on the beach, birds breeding on the beaches, uh, pollination systems in the fynbos, um, urban e ecosystems, uh, things like that. We'll do the research. We'll then come back and say, okay, what does that mean? Well, we'll interpret it. Um, what is the cause? What is the effect? How do we sort of unpack exactly what's happening? The nuts and bolts. Um, we then go through a process of developing out the box innovative awareness and education programs that we roll out. So that's a conservation intervention program and we involve people. We get people emotionally connected to what we're doing and we uh, enable them to be part of the solution. We then look at, okay, how do we need to change the way that particular system is managed? Do we need to work with the municipality like we did with the beaches and zones for dogs? Do we need to work with um, sand parks in terms of how the estuary mouth is managed in Nature's Valley? Do we need to work with a particular ratepayers association or a group of interested people uh, for that particular um, problem? And then very importantly, we assess the impact of our work. So are, is what we're doing having the result that we'd hoped? Is it a positive influence on the biodiversity um, or are we just wasting our money and doing something that might look sexy on social media and maybe appease people to think that they're doing their environmental bit, but if it's not having any impact on the animals or the plants, then we're actually wasting our time. So I don't know if you noticed, but there's a very nice acronym there. I really wanted to get the acronym RIANA because I could put it to music and have something really fun, but actually the, it ended up with an M rather than an N, so it's RIANA but it's almost like a margarine, I suppose. <laughs> but anyway, that's what we do. Here's just a couple of photos just to remind us what Nature's Valley itself looks like. Um, so our office is based in that building over there. We're on the ground floor. Half the ground floor is taken up by the Nature's Valley Ratepayers Association. They've got the nice side and we've got the garage side. Um, they've got one staff member in there. We've got uh, four staff members and intern and four international students on our side. But we make it work and we enjoy it and we have a very good working relationship with them. Um, so let me just show you kind of some of the things that we're doing. So on the ecological research front, we're currently hosting three MSc and three PhD students from around the world, including some South African students. We're working in estuaries, we're working on the coast, um, in the bay, in Feinbos, and in urban areas. Uh, and got programs and projects running on all of those, and I'll show you some of those. We also host international volunteers and interns, and we have research partnerships with Sand Parks, with Cape Nature, University of Cape Town, University of Kuzini Natal, Nelson Mandela University, and a couple of overseas universities as well. So on the Fainbos side, we're really interested in understanding the impact that habitat fragmentation due to lots of development and changing land uses and things like that, and climate change has on our Fainbos, uh, which is a very sensitive ecosystem. Um, now there's only there's six plant kingdoms in the world, and we can 
logically think, well, forest is a plant kingdom and grassland is a plant kingdom, but Feinbos is a plant kingdom. It's one of the six kingdoms in the world, and it's restricted to just two provinces in South Africa. And from a plant biodiversity point of view, it's up there with the Amazon rainforests. There are nine, over 9,000 species of plants in the Feinbos biome, and it's restricted to these two little provinces in South Africa, and under immense threat from habitat fragmentation and development along coastal areas. So we've done a whole lot of work over the last sort of seven years studying birds and plants that they pollinate and the nectar that they drink and the effect of these sort of factors um, on those systems. And we're publishing some really interesting research um, and have had some nice uh, postgraduate studies coming out of it as well. So for example, these uh, bags and cages that we put on flowering plants enable us to identify the role of insects or birds as the pollinators of those plants. Um, so a bag like that excludes everything. So there we're actually aiming to investigate the plant's ability to reproduce without a partner. Now, don't put your hands up if you know what that is, because um, we don't want to give away secrets. But uh, some plants can produce viable seed without having pollen transferred from another flower. They can do it themselves. A lot of plants can't, but some species can. And those species that can will obviously do better in a fragmented environment when you're less reliant on an external pollinator. The cage excludes birds, but not insects. And it, so it helps us to understand the role of birds in the ecosystem. And so these are three different red hot poker flowers or heads. This had the bag on, so you can see there isn't a single fruit on that on that stem. This was open to insects but not birds. And there's some some fruit set with a few seeds in it. And that one's open to birds as well. And so birds in the case of red hot pokers are the most important pollinator. Even though bees will visit them and collect pollen and do all of that sort of stuff they're not actually contributing that much to the reproduction of that plant. So that's the type of stuff that we unpack. We have done some work in the past in um, the river systems in the Tsitsikama area, focusing on macroinvertebrates, so the big insects that live in our rivers, and using them as an indicator of, of water quality and, and river quality. Um, and a project that was done by Nature's Valley Trust before I arrived studied 11 different river systems in the Tsitsikama area. And just during that three-year study, um, discovered 36 new species to science that had never been described before. A lot of them, majority of them, from the Salt River in Nature's Valley. And the Salt River is interesting. It's one of three rivers in the Tsitsikama where there's no fish in the freshwater sections of those rivers. And these macroinvertebrates have exploded and filled the niches that fish fill in other rivers. Uh, some of them are still being described. It takes a long time to do that sort of stuff. We do a lot of work in the Groot River estuary, looking at the importance of that small estuary to fish production for the ocean. And so four times a year we use big nets and we run this project on behalf of sand parks. Uh, we uh, have six different sites and we take a 30 meter seine net and we haul in the fish like um, a biblical fisherman of old and we measure and count every single fish. If they're big enough, like this Leophis there, I will put a tag in too so that we can monitor that fish over time. Um, but for the most part, they're small little things. And our record catch on a single day was 27,500 fish that we netted in February this year. And we counted and measured, not measured all of them, but counted all of them, and then measured um, a big chunk of them as well. And that research has shown us that that little estuary in Nature Valley is one of the most crucial nursery grounds along the whole garden route for white stem brass and Cape stunt maize. And it's now the longest standing data set of its kind in the Western Cape. So sand parks find it invaluable. We've got five years of seasonal data of fish use in that estuary. And we can use some of the other more sensitive fish, like the greater pipefish and the, um, the black hand sole, which are really good indicators of water quality and estuary quality, to show how um, fantastic that estuary is. We also do have an interesting um, alien in that estuary system, though. 
This is called a mosquito fish, um, and its uh, native range is Mexico, and uh, it was introduced into a range of different river systems in South Africa um, and across the world. It's listed as one of the world's worst invasive species. And yet, ironically, we have very little idea of the impact it has on native um, animals and plants and invertebrates. And so we've been monitoring again for five years on behalf of Sandparks and 11 different sites in the estuary where we go every month and sample and count the sexes and measure them and work out uh, what's happening with this invasive species in the estuary. And we're slowly getting an idea that the population is increasing over time but it doesn't seem to have a major impact on the, the natural fish populations in the estuary. Um, we then have probably our, uh, publicly our most well-known project, and that is our Coastal Impact Program. And we've got three projects underneath this program. It runs, it runs on beaches. So we've had a, a Fishing Impact Program, which we ran for about four years, where we try to engage with recreational fishermen to work out What's the impact of fishing on our local fish stocks, on the litter, on the beaches, and things like that? How is it regulated? Is it working? Is it not working? What's happening? Um, and we've had some really good success with that project and really good feedback and participation from local fishermen. We then have a project that we've been running, monitoring um, different types of litter on our beaches. Where is it from? Is it mostly wash-up litter like you get in places like Durban? I don't know if you saw photos from Durban earlier this week. Litter on the beach that literally stretches the entire length of this room as a belt and for several kilometers along the coastline and about that deep, just with plastic, just after the recent rains. So every time it rains in Durban, it comes down the rivers, washes up on the beaches, and you've got to go and do a beach cleanup. Fortunately, our beaches don't look that bad, but they're still full of rubbish. We get a lot of stuff on our beaches. And most of it is from local sources. It's not wash-up. It's from us dropping litter on our beaches as people. And then the, um, our breeding shorebird project is what we've really uh, spent a lot of time and money and energy on trying to understand the birds that breed on our beaches. So let's look at that quickly. Our shorebirds, um, it's really about managing and mitigating the impacts of beach breeding birds. Um, these birds breed from August until March on our beaches. Uh, we work mostly on white-fronted plovers, which is, are these cute little guys there, these little baby chick, uh, and African black oyster catchers. And we mostly now work on Lookout Beach and the Nature's Valley beaches. Those are the two highest density breeding populations that we have. Um, and we do some nest management, so if you're on those beaches, you'll see little rope enclosures with nesting area signs and the bird breeding in the middle. Um, we've had the dog regulations in place for two years now as a management um, intervention. Legally, for the first time, allowing dogs off-leash on beaches. So as conservationists, we fought for the rights of dogs to be off-leash on beaches, and we succeeded, and the municipality allowed it in certain zoned areas. Um, and what it's led to is an improvement in the breeding success of our plovers because we've separated dogs and birds and uh, done a lot of education and awareness and enabled it to look much better. When we started in 2015-2016, and this is a graphic um, that shows the number of eggs that were laid that season by white-fronted plovers, we had 152 eggs across 25 kilometers coastline from Robert through to Nature's Valley. 58 of those eggs hatched. So just over a third only hatched, and of those, only 15 fledged and added inputs. It was a 9.8% breeding success. And in my 20 years as an ornithologist studying a lot of the rare and endangered species in our country, this was the lowest breeding success I'd ever seen. And it was supposedly not uh, a species of conservation concern. And what had happened at the same time was some research came out that showing that bird has lost 40% of its population in just 30 years in the Western Cape. And it's mostly disturbance on beaches by dogs and people. So we did bring in the trial, uh, the dog zonation system. So green is a happy dog that can bound on the beach uh, without a leash, legally for the first time in Plet. Orange was your typical existing dog on a leash zone. And red was your typical existing, no dogs allowed on that zone, uh, on that beach. And that would be your blue flag beaches, some of your high-density tourism beaches. 
and in the case of Lookout Beach, um, a really high density bird breeding area. On Lookout Beach alone, that one little beach, we have at least 15 pairs of white trunted plovers, 10 pairs of African black oyster catchers, about 500 pairs of kelp gulls. We've got African black, uh, African sacred ibis breeding there this year, about 200 of them. We've got Egyptian geese, uh, water thick knees, three banded plovers, all these different species that breed on that one little beach. Um, so we've got to do our best to, to safeguard them. Did we try to safeguard every bird in Plettenberg Bay? No, that would be really doff and it would alienate people because I would have had to say no dogs on beaches. But for example, there are two pairs of plovers that try to breed there near Sanctuary Beach and the Wedge. And they're never successful. They never were successful when we started the project, and they're still not successful. That's okay. In fact, two years in a row, the one pair lost both their chicks. They were driven over by the quad bike of the NSRI. Because of the way those chicks respond, when mom gives a peep that there's danger, they just freeze exactly where they are. And you can stand on them, they won't move. They'll just go pop. That was a joke, but it's uh, not a very good joke. <laughs> So we're not interested in saving every bird, but save the ones where they're in big congregations, and that's Nature's Valley and Lookout Beach. Um, so we've also put up these rope enclosures like I told you about, and you can see here, outside the enclosure and inside the enclosure, the difference of foot traffic on those beaches. So that's, that's just a section in Nature's Valley. That's how many people walk our beaches. In fact, our maximum counts on Lookout Beach of number of people walking through a bird's territory over a two-hour period, we, we, we massed over a thousand people in a two-hour period walking through the bird's territory, and over 50 dogs walking through a bird's territory. And those little birds are what I call obsessive-compulsive conspiracy theorists. They are petrified and they're convinced that everyone is out to get them. So their whole way they've evolved is to be cryptic and hide and run away when there's danger. And then those eggs sit on the sand and they cook and they die because they're not incubating to warm their eggs in summer, they're incubating to cool their eggs. And so the eggs die, and that's why we have so few of them hatching. But these little rope enclosures are working, and people are staying away from the nests, and we've had massive increases in breeding success, especially in Nature's Valley. So we've doubled the breeding success in Nature's Valley. It's now at a more natural level of around 30%. Look up each, we had a 50% increase in breeding success and just lack of enforcement of the dog regulations has meant that last year we had our lowest breeding success ever in, on Look Up Beach. We also had some nests washed away with floods. So it's not all dogs, there is natural factors as well. But dogs generally do still play a role on Look Up Beach, unfortunately. The fishing impact project so we interviewed fishermen, we measured their catches, we looked at compliance rates with local regulations, we looked at their understanding of the regulations. And so when you interview a fisherman, you say, do you understand the local regulations for fishing? 80% of them said, yes, we understand them and we abide by them. But when you actually measure them through questions and measuring their fish and understanding what's happening, only about 20% were complying with the regulations. We did an education program. We handed out resource packs with locally relevant um, sort of flip guides of the fish that you can expect to catch, how big it is, the catch regulation that you can keep it, how many you're allowed to catch uh, uh, or keep and take home and all of that sort of thing. Tape measure in every bag. And we repeated the study a few years later. And now, while only 20% used to understand the regulations, we're now up to over 75% at least understanding the regulations. Still the issue with compliance. <laughs> we also put up fishing line bins, which enabled um, members of the public when walking on a beach to collect up fishing line they found on the beach and safely put it in those bins. And I'll show you some stats about that just now, but we've dramatically reduced the amount of fishing related litter on our beaches. So our marine debris work is not the most glamorous sort of BBC wildlife type research. It involves walking with a GPS and GPSing every single piece of litter that you find on a beach and classifying it into the type of litter it is and then also GPSing every person you see using the beach. And so when we first started this research in Nature's Valley a number of years ago, we found that fishermen made up 10% of the beach users 
but 39% of the litter was fishing related. And that excluded their food and beverage containers. That was just their bait boxes and their tackle plastics and bait cotton reels and things like that. And so there's a, a little map just from one month of sort of hot spots of where litter is found on the beach in Natchez Valley. And then through that awareness and the education and the fishing line bins and all of that, we've been able to reduce that down um, quite dramatically. So we did that by putting the fishing line bins in in 2015, started education and awareness with local fishing groups. Uh, we, we started um, what is probably one of South Africa's first ever community-based fishing clubs in the Kovi area in 2017. Uh, local fishermen that we get on board to now understand and abide by the regulations, and they then educate fellow fishermen, rather than an epileptic sand pass ranger trying to do it, or even an NGO person trying to do it. So change within communities. And then Share the Shores, the fishing line um, program with the education resource packs and all of that was also in 2017. And what that's meant is that, so this is the amount of fishing line we've taken just out of our fishing line bins year on year. This is incomplete because that's only up until, I think, March this year. Um, but we've had a 75% reduction in fishing-related litter on our beaches through educating fishermen and through our efforts of enabling people to take fishing line and hooks and that off our beaches. So again, this is how we measure success of our program. So is it worth donating and funding to us? Yes, because it makes a difference. After you've donated to the Historical Society, of course. <laughs> At the beginning of last year, we launched a completely new research division. We launched a, a marine program. So we have a secondary office now in Plettenberg Bay at Lion Roar's house, and I have a team of marine scientists based there. Uh, we've got two main components to the work there. We've got a, a big project funded by Nedbank Green Trust, um, touching just over 2 million rand over three years to investigate the sustainability of boat-based marine tourism using Plettenberg Bay as a case study. So what is the impact of those boats on our animals? What are the compliance rates on the regulations that they're supposed to abide by? What is the attitude towards sustainable tourism by your tourists that come from overseas? What is their understanding of it? How is the industry marketing itself? You open up a brochure or website on any of those companies and someone's leaning over a boat about to touch a whale. Well, that's illegal. So we've actually got a paper we're just busy publishing at the moment, um, my team and I, and just looking at the websites of the 17 companies in South Africa that are licensed to do boat-based whale watching, and the compliance rates just based on their websites. And they're not compliant even on their website because they false advertising because it makes sense to put these sexy photos on because then you're going to attract the tourists. But actually, research shows that if your pre-experience concept of what you're going to see is vastly different from what you're actually going to see in reality, that leads to a dissatisfied tourist. And so improving your marketing by being more realistic leads to a more satisfied tourist and less pressure on your guide to break the rules because he, the tourist hasn't seen what said, the brochure said they're going to see. So we're working with government, with the Department of Environment Affairs, to reassess the sustainability of that industry. That industry has doubled in size in the last 20 years, and it's set to double even, uh, even more because of Operation Pakisa, which is the unlocking of the, the green economy. It's uh, the government's drive to develop marine um, economy. We're also developing, for the first time, we're working with government to, to look at the Cape Fur Seal swimming with seals industry. That's completely unregulated. You don't need a permit to do that. Any company can start up and do that. But we don't know how sustainable is it, that is for the animals or the environment. And so we're working with environmental affairs for the first time to measure the impact on those animals. And may I say that that project was initiated by the owner of the longest standing seal swim company in Plate Offshore Adventures. Very positive, very proactive, an industry member himself saying, I want to prove that what I do is sustainable, I want help doing that, and I want the government to regulate my industry. That's the caliber of people that we have running businesses in Plate. It's fantastic to see. Um, and then we also do a whole lot of supporting research in the marine environment because we now have our own research boat. So we've got a big marine research boat. 
Um, her name is Fluke. She's a big rubber duck, uh, one of the fastest boats in the bay. And um, we support work from international universities and our local resident whale expert, Dr. Gwyneth Penry, on brooders whales, which is a resident species of whale that lives in our bay. And Gwen has been working with an American university to put satellite tags on those um, whales. So they run them down with our boat with a big pole and a suction cap and whack the, whack the transmitter on the whale and are able to see uh, how deep those whales go, how often they feed, what their speeds are and that. And it's based on that research that Gwen has been able to work with uh, Barbara Creasy, our Minister of Environmental Affairs, to reevaluate that octopus trap fishing industry that was banned in False Bay for a couple of months because of the whale deaths. Well, two of the 11 whale deaths were brooders whales in Plettenberg Bay. The first one that ever died in South Africa, wrapped by octopus lines, was in Plett. And we had one earlier this year, it was the second one in Plett. And Gwen was the only cetacean scientist on the minister's specialist panel that reevaluated that industry. And just last week, the minister has lifted the ban, allowed the industry co to continue, but with really good mitigation measures to make sure that the lines are sunk and that there's no cause uh, for harm for our whales. And put in place that if one single more brooder's whale dies in that industry, that industry will be closed down for good. So a very, very positive move from our government. And some of that is based on research that Gwen has done right here in our bay. We also do some work with humpback dolphins, with one of the researchers from the Orca Foundation, um, and work with sort of other groups. We've got uh, those massive clam washouts that have been happening the last few years. We're working with Sandbox to estimate um, the numbers of washouts. The one earlier this year was 11.5 million clams. Um, so when people say our seals eat all the fish, no, they don't. When you analyze the content of the fish, of, of the diets of our seals and robbers, they don't catch the fish that you and I target as recreational fishermen. We don't have fish in our bay as fishermen because we've kept all the fish. The seals are eating clams and anchovies and sardines and other stuff and deep water species. They, they fish for deep water hake and gurnard and things like that. Um, so if you want to see some of the biggest fish around reefs and plets, go and dive off Robert next to the seals. You'll see all the big fish there. Come to uh, Beacon Isle Rocks to the reefs there where the fishermen have access and there's no big fish. So interesting. Don't, don't uh, hold it against me that I don't blame our seals for everything. So, so there's our research boot uh, by Fluke, um, and here's some of our crew at sea doing uh, some research. We do a lot of land-based surveys with the uh, theodolite, measuring the speed of the animals, their breathing rates, and then when the boat comes along, you measure the change in the animal's behavior. The speed of the boat, are they sticking to the approach speed they're allowed to operate in? Are they sticking to the distance they're allowed to stay away from the whale, and that sort of thing. Uh, and we're doing that with the industry, so the operators know what we're, do what we're doing, and... Um, they, they are hopefully uh, happy that someone is helping them to ensure that their livelihood is sustainable. And there's some really cool photos from some of our team members of uh, the fantastic animals we have in our bay. Okay, so that's research done and dusted. Our conservation education work is really crucial <coughs> because um, it really starts at school level where you can capture the imagination and the, the mindset and the behavior of children. And so we've got uh, outdoor, outdoor classrooms in Nature's Valley. We run eco-schools in local clubs. We have a birding masters and champions program. It's uh, bird clubs in four local schools. Uh, we have an adopt a river program where we use those little macro invertebrate insects and we get kids to measure water quality of the river that runs through their community based on the aquatic insects we find in that river. We have an adopt a beach program where we take grade seven learners onto the beach for seven different lessons during the course of the year to understand beach ecosystems, the ecology and the impact that we as people have on those systems. We have holiday programs that we run in Easter and December for holiday makers and locals, just to get a, a, a kind of fun um, sort of atmosphere going and do some conservation related activities. It's also an important fundraiser opportunity for us. And then we focus on things like Water Week and Marine Week and Arbor Day and things like that in the local schools and that as well. And we assist Sand Parks with their big uh, Kids in Parks program when they host that in the City Karma area. We are the partner that runs that for them. So here are just some photos of typical sort of outings for many of our communities that surround Plett. 
A kid in grade seven would be what we would have known as a standard five, sort of the end of primary school. You will be surprised that for the vast majority of those children living within five kilometers of the beach, they have never been to the beach. And we take them onto the beach and we teach them about beaches and conservation. It's absolutely special. We take some of them on boats and we teach them about our seals and our whales and our dolphins. And it's, it's fantastic that we can do that. Uh, we sometimes partner with Two Oceans Aquariums and other organizations that come and um, partner with us. We've got Two Oceans Aquariums coming in February next year, going into all the schools and teaching them about turtles. Because we get baby turtles washing up on our beaches stranded every year, and we're trying to rescue as many of those as possible. This is uh, some of our, our bird clubs that we run in local schools. We run in four local schools, and we partner there. Because we also try and think out the box of cutting costs. So the local bird club fund our time to coordinate a project where the bird club members take school kids bird watching and teach them about conservation and it costs virtually nothing. So you can do high impact programs at a low cost um, if you're clever about how you do it. Um, and some of these kids are just now passionate about bird watching which is really great. Um, in terms of community engagement we try to operate with some of the communities that we work with at a more holistic level of lifestyle changes, of recycling, of greening their communities, tree planting, vegetable growing, stuff like that. And some of these projects have been running for over 15 years now. Um, and Julie initiated a lot of these programs. Um, two of notes that I'd like to just highlight today is a gardening club that we facilitate in the Curland community. It's called the Titi Tainir Gardening Club. It's been running for about five years now. And we planted the seed, if you'll excuse the pun, with community members who were interested about doing something about home-based vegetable gardening. And we facilitated, because we're an NGO, we've got the skills to put a group together, but we wanted it to be run and driven by the community. So we now administrate a community committee that ha has a membership. You pay to be a member of the gardening club, an annual subscription, you get benefits for that membership, and you get to be part of this program where we educate and help you better understand how to produce vegetables and fruit at home. And then every year in December, there's an annual competition where we get an external panel of judges to come in and uh, grade the gardens. And some of the best, most amazing produce you've ever seen are coming out of little backyard gardens in Kerland. We then thought our typical NGO um, sort of sustainable mindset well, let's help them set up a little farmer's market so that they can generate income from their gardens. And the community said, no, we don't want that. We give the excess away to our friends and our neighbours in need. So we come with our Western mindset of everything's about money. Actually, sometimes it's just about Ubuntu. As you're doing something, you're getting enough for yourself and you give the rest away. And the community love it. It's a really fantastic project. Um, and then our Kobe Fishing Club uh, developed their own logo, we've got sponsored shirts, we sometimes have combined uh, fishing outings with uh, the Pet Angling Association, um, and uh, some of these guys have participated in pet fishing competitions, and it's been really great seeing how this core group of fishermen from a local community have really embraced wanting to do things right. Okay, uh, the other thing we've been very fortunate to do is to give a lot of money away. To other projects and so for the last two years and going into a final year next year we've been a funding node for the table mountain fund where every year i get to choose from applications that apply to us up to seven projects at least that we give a total of two hundred and ten thousand rand a year to ranging from five thousand to fifty thousand to a particular project and just some of the projects we've funded over the last few years is some of you might recognize the, the logo Renewable Pet. It's an initiative of a range of organizations in Pet under one umbrella to try and reduce single-use plastic in Plettenberg Bay. So we've had something like, um, I think it's about 50 establishments in Pet stop using plastic straws, about uh, 40 stop using plastic bags, about 30 uh, enabling you to get a discount if you bring your own coffee mug for your takeaway coffee. And all these different initiatives have been done by a range of organizations, but under that banner, and we funded that um, for two years. Muddy Pooches, a really fantastic um, animal welfare project uh, based out of Dunlop, 
Uh, we've been able to fund some of their work uh, this year. We had a small grant with PAWS as well, working in the Kobe community. Uh, we've formalized the PLEC Animal Stranding Network for animals that strand on the beaches. Uh, we were able to fund them to formalize their program, get some branding, get us a dedicated cell phone hotline and put systems in place. We developed an environmental hiking trail in the Kobe community, formalized that, uh, trained some local guards and put signage in that in place. We gave them the money for that. Um, and then this year we funded um, the Vitadrift Birding Festival, which happened a month or so ago. Really fantabulous community-driven initiative with local guards as well. Uh, bringing people into Vitadrift to look at birds and to increase the tourism profile of Vitadrift. And then we have had some funding for Keep Pet Clean, some environmental education projects they've been running in some of the primary schools. Um, so that's, that. I get a real kick out of that. We funded in the previous two years 19 projects to the tune of 420,000 Rand. And I've currently got a call for funding open. It closes, I think, on the 14th or something. And we've had some applications and we're going to be giving out another 210,000 Rand next year. Um, and then just the last few slides are that sort of fourth umbrella, the conservation in action, really focuses on the nitty gritty about making a difference holistically to our area. And just some quick examples. Um, many of you might remember a few years ago, PLEP was um, designated as one of uh, Sylvia Earle's international hope spots for marine conservation. So, and we used it as an opportunity to formally link our two marine protected areas to say this bay and what it's got in it is special and it needs to be recognized as a special place for marine conservation. Um, it was also through BirdLife International recognized as an important bird and biodiversity area on a global directory of sites um, and it also joins the two marine protected areas and covers the framebos and the forest there as well because we've got 10% of the global population of Cape Cormorants breeding on Robert, for example. Uh, and, and it's an endangered bird. Um, and we've got 5,000 of them that breed on Robert every year. It's amazing. We've got uh, fangbors and forest birds that are range restricted, only occur in certain parts of the world, and they're right here in our, in our area. We do uh, manage the Urban Conservancy, which is the whole of Nature Valley residential area is a registered conservancy with Cape Nature. And so we help with developing sort of guidelines for managing alien invasive plants in your garden, um, a lot of sort of education and awareness, and we then advise the municipality how to manage the open spaces that are available, the public open spaces in Nature's Valley. We also deal with baboons, which is the bane of my life because we don't actually have a baboon problem, we have a people problem. It's the same, we don't have a dog problem in Plet on our beaches, we have a people problem on our beaches in Plet. And so we, the interface between authorities and homeowners, we do a lot of education awareness about managing your waste uh, and access into your home. Um, we facilitate an early alert warning system in Nature's Valley, we've got a WhatsApp group and everyone's on that group, and so if you see the baboons walking down the road, put it on the group so that your neighbor 10 doors down knows I better go and close the front door, otherwise I'm going to get some unscheduled guests. Um, and we collect some basic research data to understand the hotspots of where baboons are in Valley and that. So this is a, a hotspot map of um, sort of sightings of baboons by one of our students a few years ago. Uh, just understanding that, you know, that they do really go right throughout the whole valley, but there are particular entry points and contact points and often that you can identify the houses that are really bad at managing access because that's where the baboons just go to naturally. We then work, um, do a lot of animal rescue work. Um, our terrestrial network is really Tanikwa and radical raptors that we work with a lot. Um, and then through the Pet Marine Animal Stranding Network, we um, one of the key partners and we actually currently host that network and administrate it. Um, and then the African Penguin Release Program with um, Tanikwa, which is on Saturday. So you have the Stranding Network um, in operation. This was a, a baby humpback whale that stranded in Nature's Valley um, about two years ago. Uh, still alive. That sadly had to be euthanized. Um, one of the most horrific moments of my life as a conservationist um, being with Dr. Penry, who is the, the sort of permitted authority in place to deal with these and to make the call 
that that animal has to be euthanized. And um, I'm not going to tell you how that is done. Uh, if anyone wants to know, you can ask me afterwards. But it was not a, a very nice experience. What is a nice experience, you can see on Saturday at 9 o'clock at Lookout Beach. Don't be like Len and rock up at 9 o'clock or 5 to 9. You won't get a parking. We've had up to 550 people on the beach at one of our releases before. So come early, get a parking, get a good spot and enjoy. On Saturday we're releasing hopefully 14 penguins. It's our biggest release yet. And it's the 10th release that we've done in the last few years since we re-initiated releases of penguins in play. So come and experience it. It's a real feel-good moment for the community. Um, we input into a lot of citizen science projects. Um, so, for example, uh, this is a jackal buzzard with a special colouring on that you can actually then identify the individual uh, just with a pair of binoculars or a digital camera. We've got colouring projects like that on our oyster catchers and our plovers as well. So we've got a couple of members of the public who regularly send me photographs of our oyster catchers. I can read the data from the photograph and I get really valuable scientific information. Um, and here's a map of all the buzzards that we have ringed across the garden route in the last two years. I've got a team of five citizen scientists, so members of the public who are bird ringers, who go out and catch jackal buzzards and forest buzzards for us. So all the red, red uh, buzzards are ringed jackal buzzards. The black ones are ones that have been recaptured, and the white ones are ones that have been photographed. And then the, the forest buzzards are these brown ones, and the recaptured forest buzzards are like a slaty grey colour. There haven't been too many of those. But this is one that Vinti Neufeld uh, photographed in Vitadrift a few weeks ago, and had been ringed by one of our ringers in Vitadrift about six weeks before that. That's an immature jackal buzzard. Okay. On the home stretch, we're almost done. Not too many people sleeping, so that's a good sign. Um, we host these interns. So I just wanted to introduce you to our current uh, three current interns. We have Lauren on the left, who is a conservation master's graduate and is with us for a year, funded by WWF. We're the longest standing NGO to host interns for WWF, dating all the way back to when Cindy first did her first internship. She was in the first crop of interns at WWF ever placed in uh, host organizations, and we've hosted every single time they've done it. And then on the right show is a new project where we are hosting conservation diploma students from Sarsfeld, from Nelson Mandela University, who had to do a year of work placement to finish off their conservation diploma. And we've had Akila and Hannah with us for the whole year, and they've added great value to our marine team, so they're based in Plet. Akila is actually a Plet local, born and raised. Uh, and Hannah is from the Cape Town area, but they've really just added immense value. And we've got three students coming in next year to our marine team from NMU. And we've got a local lad from New Horizon who's just finished her diploma. And we've taken her on as a full-time um, marine intern next year as well, which is really exciting. It's a two-way partnership, so the interns get a lot out of it. Although they don't get a salary, or in Lauren's case she does, but the NMU students don't, they get experience and work uh, and exposure in a hands-on conservation oriented NGO. Um, they work aside my team of experienced conservationists. They get mentored, skills development, career guidance, and they get to do what most people dream of doing. And they do it right here in Pettenberg Bay. What we get is additional staff at no cost to us, so added capacity to do this range of work that we do. And we get the opportunity to develop young South African conservationists, which is something I'm particularly passionate about. Um, our intern students, so these are mostly internationals, although we do get some South African families paying for this opportunity too. Uh, students can come and either do environmental education and community work or conservation research, but for the most part they do everything. We're limited to a max of four interns in Nature's Valley at a time. We hire a house there and we house them there. And then we've just started an internship program this year in Plet as well with our marine team. And we had um, a German girl and two Dutch guys as our first three interns based in Plet this year. Uh, they also get what we offer, are so short to long term options. Um, they spend at least 50% of their time in the field learning practical skills. And they work in this incredible part of the world um, and go back to their countries with relevant resume quality experience in Africa, which is actually seeing a lot of them sort of leapfrog some of their colleagues back home 
and walk into jobs as young graduates because of the work experience they've got there in Plet. Um, and then just to finish off, so what's the big picture of what we do? And so our marine and coastal workers, we really want to protect this bay and our beaches. And so long term, I would love to see the government linking our two marine protected areas. Not to stop us as locals from doing what we like to do in our bay, but to stop what, to be honest, is raping and pillaging of our bay's resources by external commercial interests. So like what's been happening quite a lot this year is we have legal permitted shark longliners coming and catching a whole lot of sharks in our bay. And they're allowed to do it at the moment. We have per se netters from around the country who come in and take out sardines and anchovies. They're allowed to do it. But those sardines and anchovies are the lifeblood of our tourism industry because it's those sardines that sustain the seals and the cormorants and the penguins and the, the, the bottlenose dolphins and the brooders whales and all this diversity that brings tourism into our bay. At the moment, legally, they can come and take all of it if they've got the permit and if they've got the quota to do it. So we've got to think long-term of really safeguarding our bay. And that's one of my long-term goals. The long-term goal of our Fangbos and river work is to better understand how this fragmentation of our ecosystem affects the ecosystem services that mean so much to us. So the pollination and the clean water and the, the fish nursery systems and all of that that we can't really put an economic value to it, but it actually underpins the sort of society and integrity of our ecosystems. We've got to understand that better. And then the long-term goal of our education and community work is better educated and mobilized communities that understand the impact that they have on our local biodiversity and actually change their behavior to adjust to it. How are we funded? Well, we're funded in a variety of different ways. Um, we do take monthly and yearly donations from individuals. We do have project funding from the lotto when we're really fortunate and from things like Table Mountain Fund and Ned Bank Green Trust. We are part of the My School program. So if you uh, don't have a My School card, the first thing you want to do is get one and add PAWS and Nature's Valley Trust as beneficiaries. And because uh, you can have three beneficiaries on your card, so you can have the grandkids, school, pause, and Nature's Valley Trust. Or you can just have Nature's Valley Trust. The cho choice is totally up to you. We get funding from our intern program. We do take CSI funding from corporates because we have a level um, 2 BEE certification. We also section 18A tax certified, so companies or individuals donating to us can claim back from so on. And then we have some out-the-box fundraising ideas. So we just launched our own coffee brand called Otaniqua Blue, um, which is a Joburg coffee roastery that every brand, every blend that they create, they dedicate to a particular conservation cause. And I think it's 10% of the sale of every single bag. And 10% is actually quite a lot for a product. 10% um, goes directly to the cause. And so we, we stocking that as beans or ground coffee. It's actually a fabulous coffee. I was so stressed. Imagine somebody offers you this blend, you get it, and it tastes disgusting, and now you've got to market it because you want to raise money. And actually, it's so good, I drink it at home. It's like a really nice coffee. And my church now uses it on Sundays too, which is really cool. You can at the moment buy it from the Nature's Valley Trust office in Nature's Valley or Plettenberg Bay. But watch this space. We are pretty certain that really soon it's going to be at Roberg Fine Foods and it's going to be at Quick Spa, Duncan's Quick Spa down um, Bar Beacon Isle. Okay, and maybe at Radical Raptors too. They want him to stock, stock it in the owl shop as well for us. And then we also, if you go up to Addo or Storms River and you eat at the Cattle Baron restaurants, you are supporting Nature's Valley Trust. So Sand Parks have this incredible deal with anyone who operates a restaurant on Sand Parks land. You get a 10-year lease, and you have to have a community-based organization as one of your shareholders. It's got to be a 10% profit shareholder. And, so 10 and we're, we're the shareholder for those two restaurants. Um, and so we get sustainable income from that, which funds one of my staff salaries every year, and which has enabled us to start developing a trust fund. 
so that we don't have to have the position which you guys are currently in where you stand and say we have one month of funding. <laughs> because I know what that's like. Within six months of arriving in Nature's Valley, NBT ran out of funds, couldn't pay salaries. And that's when I was told I was responsible for fundraising as well. <laughs> so it was a really exciting adventure. We had to make some serious decisions as a family, having just relocated our young kids here. And we decided God's called us here. We're sticking it out. We're going to make a go of it. And seven years later, what a journey. It's been an amazing ride, and we love it. You can find out more about us however you choose. We have a website, we have a Facebook account, we have a Twitter account, an Instagram account. We post a blog now and then. And we have a newsletter that we email out just once a month. And you can sign up for that if you really want to find out more about what we do. Um, and then I'll leave you with this incredible photo that one of my Dutch interns took down in Natchez Valley a few years ago. At sunrise, um, just a reminder that we live in the most incredible part of the world. And as an organization, we feel incredibly privileged every day to get up and say we get to work hard to keep it looking like this. Thank you for the invite and thank you for listening. All I can say is fantastic. Absolutely amazing. I think we'll all agree. Before I um, ask David Hall Green to thank the speaker, any questions? I know we're going to have some drinks through there, so possibly you could ask questions later. But any questions for now? Southern right whale. Hmm. There's been a decrease or decline in the Roburg area. There's been a decline across the whole coastal area of South Africa. Um, and in fact, global numbers aren't down, but they've shifted. So because of the sudden uh, oscillating El Nino system, changing ocean currents with climate change, we're in a sequence now where they've moved off. So this year's council for the South African coastline, the whole coastline, were the lowest in 40 years. Last year, we were the highest in 40 years. So it's, it's nothing sinister, it's a natural process, but it is linked to climate change, possibly. Never trust everything a scientist says, definitely. <laughs> um, I now call upon David Hall Green to say thank you. Mark, uh, from all of us to all of you at Nature's Valley Trust, we salute you and we thank you for this incredible presentation. I mean, it's amazing. To put together all of this is nothing short of impressive. We thank you. Thank you very much. And you, you know, I'd just like to, to say a couple of words. I don't want to, to overstay my welcome. Uh, but you know, picking up on education, it's all about education and changing of deep-rooted cultural uh, attitudes and practices. Yeah. And, you know, if we can reach, as you are, reach all these youngsters and change attitudes. You know what is quite frightening? Being a closer speaker uh, and, and an Nguni language uh, person interested in the Nguni language. The words, the words for wildlife and meat in the Nguni language is exactly the same. It's nyama. And that means meat that you eat and wildlife. So that's the kind of attitude that we've got to change. And having grown up quite uh, uh, to a large extent on a Karoo farm, we grew up as little guys with BSA air guns and we went around shooting doves, didn't we all? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we did. Yeah. And I, I started being educated back to the point of education when I went to prep school in Grahamstown in 1948. And one of my teachers there was a wonderful lady called Joyce Ginn. And her older son was Peter, Peter Ginn, Ginn, who became a famous ornithologist and the publisher of many books. And the first time I came to Nature's Valley was a little bit before your first visit. Yes, a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, I went with Peter Ginn to, to stay in his mother's house in 1952. 
at nature's valley. Wow. And if it's paradise today, I can't begin to describe the impact that yeah. it made on me as a 14-year-old back then. So carry on with this wonderful work that you're doing. And I'm, we're all gobsmacked by the detail that you've given us. And it just makes us more and more aware of what we've got to protect. But when you present it in such detail and you realize just how much is involved. So we thank you once again and let's give him a wonderful thank you. Thank you very much.